Hello, welcome back. Modern algebra made easy. I just had myself a spoon of peanut butter, so I'm all ready to go. Sorry for the sound quality. I know it sounds like I'm recording this from a cave or something. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is with my microphone. But anyway, throwing rings and fields at you today. So now let's see if we can get at it. What is a ring? What are some characteristics of a ring? Well, it's a set, first of all, just like a group is a set under certain conditions, with certain conditions. And it's similar to a group, but with a ring we have two binary operations. One of them we're going to denote with a plus sign, and plus sign that's kind of the symbol for being abelian or abelianity which is a word I just made up for this lecture it's probably it should be a word I'm confident that eventually it will be put into Oxford, the Oxford Dictionary like everything else anyway so what does a ring look like? well we denote it like this we write it out like this just like a group, except we have an extra operation. And we don't use star, we use plus and um, a time symbol. So we say addition and multiplication, even though it may not be addition and multiplication like you're used to seeing it. It may be like matrix addition, you know, adding the components, something like that. So it doesn't mean the, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the normal addition of numbers. So we got to check for three things for a ring. It's pretty easy, especially compared to the, all the other stuff that we've done so far. So if you've understood that stuff, you're in good shape. Three things to check. Is our set under addition an abelian group? Number two, is multiplication closed and associative? It's not, doesn't need to be a group. Just needs to be closed and associative. So it doesn't explicitly state that it needs to be closed in the definition for a ring, but it is it's implied. It's inferred or implied. Anyway, it's it's gotta be closed because we're talking about two binary operations here. And if you remember, a binary operation maps uh two elements in a set to one element, exactly one element in that set. So it's got to be closed. And associative, obviously. Alright, so in the third thing, the last thing we need to check is if the left and right distribution laws hold. So just remember those three things. Abelian group, multiplication associative, and left and right distribution laws. Is it a ring? Is it a ring? Is there are the real numbers under addition and multiplication like normal? The real numbers are the real numbers. Is the is the set of real numbers under addition and multiplication a ring? Well, addition is commutative, and the reals under addition is a group. Multiplication for the reals is is associative, and closed obviously, and the left and right distribution laws hold like two times. 4 plus 6, that's 2 times 4 plus 2 times 6, right? And the same goes for the rationals, the integers, and the complex numbers, so it is a ring. Next up, we have the positive integers under addition and multiplication like normal. What do you think? This time we have addition is commutative, but it's we don't have a, an additive identity in our set. We're just talking about the positive integers, so the normal identity for the integers is zero, which is not in the positive integers, so that's not a group. We can already stop there. Not a ring. Commuted ring, so we're going to start to pile up some a little a little vocabulary, not like and it's really easy stuff, trust me. 
A ring is commutative if both addition and multiplication are commutative. That's really hard to understand. It's commutative if both operations are commutative. Right? A ring has unity if it has a multiplicative identity. So just remember that one. And we're going to call that multiplicative identity, we're going to denote that by a 1. For instance, the multiplicative identity for the matrices under multiplication would be get out of there would be the identity matrix and so a ring is a commutative ring with unity if it's commutative and it has unity go figure I'm telling you this stuff is compared to factor groups it's not too bad let's look at an example here n times the integers, so some integer, n, times all the rest of the integers. It looks like this. Multiplication is commutative, no problem. So it's a commutative ring. But there's no unity unless n equals 1. If n equals 1, we have the normal integers, which is a commutative ring with unity. If n equals, say, 2, then our set looks like we're going to have negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0, 2, 4, and 6. There's no multiplicative identity. So we can't say for sure that it's a commutative ring with unity. Example number 2, the integers cross the integers. So it's like, it's like, two, it's like an xy coordinate, for instance, you know, a point. And we addition and multiplication is just by components. We just so it has unity one one. And obviously multiplication in the integers is is commutative. So that would be a commutative ring with unity. Fields. So first up we got a little term here, a unit. Unit is just simply simply means an element with a multiplicative inverse. That's all. A division ring just means every non-zero element's a unit. So, like the real numbers will be an example under multiplication would be an example of a division ring because every non-zero element, like pi, is a unit. 1 over pi would be its inverse, and so forth. So a field is a commutative division ring. So it's just every element has an inverse, multiplicative inverse, and it's commutative. Just because it's a division ring doesn't necessarily mean it's commutative. It's a little tidbit. So for commutative rings, if every element's a unit, then the ring is a division ring. And since we already established that it's a commutative, so it's a field. So example, the reals under multiplication and addition. That would be an example of a field. Alright, let's move on. Are we at proof time yet? No, nope, not yet. Don't mix it up. Don't mix up this. These two terms. Unity and unit. So unity is the multiplicative identity and a unit refers to elements with inverses. So think unity, identity. That'll help you keep those two straight. Example of the reals under addition and multiplication. These are units, but not unity. The only element, which is both, is one. One is both unity and a unit. So our unity is a unit always. Just remember that. All the other ones, not necessarily. I don't know if that just made sense what I just said. Proof time number one. 
So this was an interesting problem that really caught my eye the more I looked at it. Show that the set of units we're going to call U. So we're collecting all the units, just like in the last lecture we collected all the torsion elements and of a ring R with unity. So the group, the ring has unity. Is a we need to show that it's a group under multiplication. So we know how to show something that's a group, right? No problem. This lecture one. We need to show that it's closed, associative, identity, has an identity, and all elements have inverses. So this is a little bit trickier than meets the eye, but there are a couple things that are pretty easy. So associativity for one is is pretty easy because we've already established that this is a ring. And a ring by definition has is associative under multiplication. So we don't need to worry about that. And since the ring has unity, which is established here, and remember what we just talked about, unity is its own inverse, so it's a unit. So it's going to be in our collection of units. So it's for sure the multiplicative identity of the set, and it's the multiplicative identity for our, it's the identity for our group, since it's in our group. Since it's a unit, and now we're gonna look at inverses. So, by definition, being a unit, that means it has a multiplicative inverse. So, in our set under multiplication, all our elements are gonna have multiplicative inverses. So we're good with that. Now the tricky part is to show if this set is closed or not. Well, we're proving that it is. So we're trying to show that the set's closed, that the set of units is closed under multiplication. Takes a little bit of finesse. So we know that R is a ring. We know R is closed under multiplication since R is defined under the binary operation which we use as a multiplication symbol. We don't know if U is closed. We don't know if our collection of units is closed. We know that the ring is closed under multiplication. We don't know if our if our uh, quit that oop, 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 oop. You didn't see that. We don't know if our collection of units is close. I just said that again. All right, so we're going to set up the problem here. Let A and B be elements in our ring that are units. So really, they're in U, big U. So since they're units, there exist two integers that are the multiplicative inverses of A and B. So if we're trying to show that that our our set U is closed, that means that when we multiply two elements in our set, that we get another unit. Two elements in our in our set of units multiply together to be another unit. That will show that it's closed. So there exists, an L, there exists basically a, a multiplicative inverse for AB. That will show that AB is a unit. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's too mind-blowing. I mean, we've done very similar things uh, in the past to this. And I think you're probably getting used to it at this point, getting used to the, the way of proving these. But if you have any questions, just feel free to let me know. You know, maybe there's some aspect that I didn't consider. So just let me know. So notice that AB, if we multiply by NM instead of MN, if we use NM, 
because we because again we don't know if this uh, ring is commutative. We know it's a let's see we know it's a commutative ring with unity. Or sorry, we know it's a ring with unity, but we don't know if it's uh, commutative. So we take AB and we multiply it times NM, and then since we know the ring, since we know it's a ring, we know it's associative, and BN that's just one as it's defined here, and AM is also one. So we've shown that NM is the right inverse for AB, and similarly. It's the left inverse for AB. So why why we just did this just now is to show that these both the both of these elements are units. They both have multiplicative inverses. AB's multiplicative inverse is NM, and vice versa. So since AB is a unit, then it's closed. Our set's closed. If we multiply two units, we get another unit. It's kind of interesting, right? I think it's interesting. And it deserves a mama check mark. So, one other thing to note is that our set U, our collection of units, will, would be a field if we knew that U was commutative, if we knew that our ring was commutative. As it is, because I was thinking about that, I was like, well, is that a field then? I mean, they all, they all have multiplicative inverses, but we need to know that it's commutative. Okay, so, second proof. We have an abelian group, R under addition, and we want to show that R under addition multiplication is a ring if we define multiplication in the ring as every element multiply with another element is zero. So we want to show that we have a ring. So the three things for showing something's a ring is the ring under addition of abelian group. Yes, that's in the setup. And the other two things are is the multiplication closed and associative and did the left and right distribution loss hold? Well multiplication is closed because if we multiply two elements we get zero and zero is definitely in our set, right? And it's also associative because A times B times C well B C is zero. And then A times any element is also zero. And then zero is zero times C, e, and zero is also A times B. So just a little bit of uh, you know manipulation to just show that it's that A times B times C equals A B times C. And then the third thing we just need to show is that the left and right distribution laws hold. So A times B plus C, well A times anything, again, if multiplying two elements in the set, in our set R, is going to be zero, and zero equals zero plus zero, and zero equals AB, and zero also equals AC. So our left distribution law holds, and it's the same thing with our right distribution law. So we got the baby check marks, and so we get a mama check mark. So we got enough baby check marks. Does the babies come before the mama? Okay, so it's a ring. So we got our third proof here. Really trying to give you guys your money's worth since you waited so long. Got an interesting problem here. I thought if a uh, if you can't follow this one, it's I don't think it's so important. Probably won't see it, but I think it's pretty interesting. So let P be your prime, and we have a ring, Z sub P, Z mod P. So for instance, like P could be seven. Like so Z mod P again we're talking about zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And it turns out that's a ring. 
And we're trying to show that a plus b to the p equals a to the p plus b to the p. Okay, and now a key thing to note here is that for z, z sub p, under multiplication, it's commutative, right? The integers under multiplication, that's commutative. And uh, if you'll remember, as long as that's true, we can use the binomial, theor binomial theorem for expansion, I think it's called, for this right here, a plus b to the, to the p. And I simplified it a little bit. I did not write out the summation symbols and stuff like that, but uh, anyway. So a plus b to the p, that's going to turn out to be some constant times a to the p, and then the, the powers of a will descend, and the powers of b will ascend, right? All the way to b to the p. And so look, let's look at what these constants look like. These constants are found by this com combination here. P choose Q, uh, P choose K, and K is going from zero to P. So, C sub zero. If we write out the, and I should put parentheses around this. So forgive me on that. But uh, here's the what the combination looks like: P factorial over K factorial times P minus K factorial. That's that's one thing. And uh, so notice for zero, k equals zero, we have p factorial over p factorial, which is one. And you get the same thing for c sub p. p choose zero and p choose p, it's the same thing, right? All right, now for the middle terms, what's special about the middle terms? Notice that they're always going to have a factor of p because since k is going to be between 1 and p minus 1, it's all, you're never going to cancel out p because it's prime. So we're always going to have, this combination here will always be a prime number. A multiple of, not, not just a prime number, it will be a multiple of p. And what do we know about multiples of p in z mod p? Well, that's 0, isn't it? So this binomial expansion turns out to be zero for all the middle terms. And so just like magic, we're done. All right, and the fourth and final proof, let ring let R be a ring with additive identity zero. Then for all elements in the ring, we're going to show two things. We're going to show zero times A is zero and a times negative b equals negative a times b which equals negative a b. In particular I really like this one here a times 0 equals 0. It's pretty cool I think. It's because you know normal algebra way of thinking in junior high or whatever of course 0 times anything is 0. Of course that makes sense but we don't really understand that. We just kind of Think, oh yeah, I can just memorize that, whatever. Um, we don't really know the fundamental reasons, so it's kind of cool. Now that we're in advanced math, we can kind of look at these reasons. And uh, have a structure for understanding why a little bit. Okay, so the way we're going to prove this, we're going to start out with a really brilliant equation. 0 plus 0 equals 0. And... Now if we multiply on the right by a, we can do that, right, no problem. And now our, we're talk, we have a ring, so the distribution laws hold, so we can distribute on the right, on the left hand side. And now we can add the additive identity of 0a. Whatever that is, let's add its, its additive inverse on the right hand side to, to this equation. Well then 0a equals 0. This is 0 right here. And this is 0. 
So, ta-da! It's pretty cool, right? I really like that one. And then the last part of the final proof. And I'm just going to prove the bold part because the middle, the middle part's the same way. So a times negative b equals negative ab. So that's what we're going to prove. So we're going to start out with a times zero equals zero, and zero is negative b plus b, isn't it? And if we use our, if we distribute on the left. We have this. And now if we add the additive identity to AB on the right hand side, we end up with A times negative B plus zero, which is A times negative B, which equals negative AB. Ta-da! So that's all she wrote for today. I'm really looking forward to the next lecture though. It's really cool actually, integral domains. And uh, I'm not sure how much more I'm gonna, I got left after that, but uh, definitely do that one. So as always, thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought if you had questions. Take care.